Right, well, thank you all for coming here today. My name is Clinton Harper and I too am a recent graduate. It, it was an awesome experience, but I am glad that I'm done with my thesis in all honesty. <laughs> but a little background about myself. I'm originally from Los Angeles and Seattle, and I moved out to Casper about four years ago for an AmeriCorps position. I was only gonna stay for a year. Long story short, I'm still here. I, I actually met my future wife, and one of my former supervisors actually went to school down here and really recommended it, and I've been truly amazed by how international Laramie is in Wyoming and the university is, in all honesty. I'm just saying this because my, it's Taiwan, not Thailand. I'm sure everyone in the room knows this. But when I first, when I first went to Taiwan to te teach English about four or five years ago, I was there for a year, I told my family, hey, I'm going to be in Thailand for a year. And they said, great, have fun in, uh, sorry. I said, I'm going to be in Taiwan for a year. And they said, great, have fun in Thailand. So, <laughs> yeah, Taiwan. Island off the southeast coast of China, Thailand, right there in Southeast Asia. Now, many scholars, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but as a tourist, many scholars would argue that you are a, an ambassador of peace, that you, whenever, whenever you go anywhere, even in, in the country, to another place, that you could potentially be promoting intercultural understanding and fostering peace. Mm -hmm. The tourist industry is massive. Each year, there are over one billion tourists from different countries, different backgrounds, you, you name it ideologies traveling and intermingling and it's because of this that a lot of scholars argue that tourism is indeed a force for peace, a potential force for peace I should say. However, there are a couple of major critiques to this concept, the peace to tourism concept. The first one is that it relies too much on rhetoric. Everyone loves the idea of peace. It's a, it's a word people throw around all the time. And, but it's, it's something that there's not enough scientific evidence to back up this claim. A lot of heads of state use it, the UN uses it, but where is the scientific evidence to back up that people actually do indeed gain and be in more peace through this? The second major critique is that rather than a promoter of peace, tourism is actually a byproduct. This critique ba is based on the assumption that in order for tourism to exist, it has to, there has to be peace in the first place. So they, they, they reference, for example, World War, World War II, tourism was around. It, that didn't stop anything from the whole world going into war and other and current examples. Another very another thing that just complicates the entire situation is that tourism is a very complex phenomenon, very multifaceted. Yes, it can produce good contact, it has a potential to foster increased understanding, but at the same time it can produce bad contact, it can produce conflict, it can despoil the environment, it can increase costs of living, you name it. It's a very a double-edged sword. On the positive side, yes, it can help the economy, it can create more jobs and aspects like that, but it is very, very, very multifaceted. And shifting from the, the whole peace of tourism concept, bringing it down to a more local level between Taiwan and China or cross strait relations. If you didn't know this, Mao Zedong led a communist revolution in mainland China in 1949, and that essentially expelled the then government to Taiwan, and that created the, exit, the, the rift that exists to this day, the one China issue is what it's called, which China is a sole legitimate China? Is it China? Is it Taiwan? And since then, relations have oscillated between warmer and cooler. One kind of interesting, to, once one interesting example to mention, in the previous administration, you have Xi Jinping from China and you have Mang Zhou from Taiwan. Their administrations worked really closely together to have more economic partnerships. However, and, it, and it's got probably the closest it's ever been in the history in over 60 years. However, one thing to point out, this picture of missiles, China, despite this, every year it adds more missiles directly across the strait, pointed directly at Taiwan. So you have very high level political tensions going on. And lastly, overshadowing everything, going once, once again to the tensions here, China states that it is the sole legitimate China, that Taiwan is part of that China, and it opposes any moves of Taiwan to push for independence. Taiwan, on the other hand, very much does act as if it's, it, it is its own independent country, and it, is a very, it has a flourishing economy. It's one of the top, top 30 economies in the world, if you didn't know that. And this, is, this right here is why I chose this topic, aside from teaching abroad in China and Taiwan. But for the first time in over 60 years, in 2008, mainland Chinese tourists were allowed to go to Taiwan. And as, as you can see from the chart here, very drastic in 2008, fairly marginal. Six, seven years later, over four million Chinese tourists that had made their way over to Taiwan. That's literally in about six years. It's very massive. So taking that into account in the peace, the peace and tourism concept, my main research question was to measure how efficient tourism is at promoting peace between, in this case, Taiwan and China. Under that, I wanted to measure the frequency and quality of the contact, but also identify any potential obstacles that might be 
in the way. It's most of these pictures I, I did take while I was there. Some of them where you can see my bikes right there. It's very beautiful. I'll show you some more pictures of Wally in a second. So what did I do? How did I perform research? Spent six weeks in Wally in Taiwan. It's the largest city on the east coast of Taiwan. Very beautiful. And I conducted approximately 37 different interviews. Also utilized participant observation. <coughs> the, the pictures here pretty much speak for themselves. It's absolutely gorgeous. Wally Ann's main resource is its environment, is its scenery. And Troco Gore's picture on the left, that is one of the top destinations for the entire country annually. Every year it has, it's one of the top five or six destinations in Taiwan from people all over the world. Now what did I find from those six weeks of study? I found a lot of obstacles to peace to tourism and a few interesting things I'm going to share with you here. First off is that Chinese group tourists, they had a reputation for being loud, rude, and inconsiderate. And basically summing up from the 37 different interviews, they basically felt that Chinese tourists embody behavior that is the opposite of what is socially appropriate in Taiwan. And I know the internet has tons of negative things on there, but this is just one example of many. This is a very recent. This was in January 2016. A group of Chinese tourists were in a public bathroom and decided to use the sink as a to give their to take a bath basically and this just enraged tons of people social media people were going crazy on there but that's honestly just one example of many that reinforces this negative stereotype that does exist another major obstacle to peace of tourism is that this influx of chinese tourists has been perceived and actually has negatively affected the significantly and negatively affected the environment a lot of interviewees they mentioned that with the influx of Chinese tourists, as I, met, as I showed you before, Wallian's beauty is its natural resource. People want to get out there and enjoy it. That's why people move there. That's why they live there. And they have no desire to go to these places anymore because it's overrun with tourists. And this is just one example of many, but this is Qixingtang, or Seven Star Beach. And on the left side, I went there twice. This, on the left side, that's a picture from Wednesday. I went on a Wednesday afternoon. It's very serene, very beautiful. Really enjoyed hardly anybody there. Went back on a Saturday afternoon, still very, very enjoyable, but it was, it was night and day. This, this right here is a picture of the parking lot. On Wednesday, it was, com it was empty. On Saturday, completely filled to the brim with ton tons of buses, tour guides holding up the little fruit pom-poms to, to wave everybody around, you name it. And there were tons of street vendors, street performers. There were even a handful of people literally just walked up and stared at me and just took my picture. They weren't being discreet, so I didn't enjoy that aspect, but everything else, it was definitely very different. Very beautiful still, but I could see why people wouldn't want to go. Potentially kind of in Yellowstone, some, some locals might not want to go there because it's overrun with a lot of tourists at times. And another key aspect of piece of tourism is responsible tourism management, basically promoting the positive aspects while mitigating those negative aspects. And that's something that the majority of interviews felt the Taiwanese government was not doing an adequate job of one student specifically mentioned that they felt the government, although it welcomed tons of Chinese tourists, was not doing a good job of preparing for the arrival of the tourists. Others felt that the government lacked a future perspective and that it was not protecting the environment, which is Wallian's prized resource. And overshadowing everything, going back to that national politics, in this case it really did seem as though, based on interviewee accounts, that national politics and tensions really do spill and overflow into Taiwanese perceptions towards Chinese tourists, or Chinese people in the China, China. When asked what Taiwanese sentiment was towards the chi China or the Chinese government, an overwhelming majority, 64%, were very negative. Why? Pretty simple. Taiwan is, or actually, there's a lot of things going into it, but the biggest thing is that Taiwan is a democracy. China is totalitarian, and from a from a from a from a democratic perspective, China's human human rights record is abysmal, and that's one of the biggest things that truly does. They, put them, they, they butt heads over that a lot. And one kind of interesting, not necessarily an obstacle, but perceptions towards Chinese tourists vary greatly according to the type of tourists. I'm sure you all know there's group tourists, individual tourists. A perfect example of a group tourist would be someone who goes to Mexico and just does an all-inclusive resort. You hardly interact with any locals, you might, probably don't speak the language, maybe not interested in the culture. And on the flip side, individual tourists, they have more freedom, they don't have a regimented schedule. And based on interview accounts, group Chinese tourists, they were considered the worst type of tourists by the majority, at least 70% of interviewees. Whereas, however, individual tourists were viewed as more approachable, more open to conversation, more interested in the culture. And this is the biggest kicker. I think they said they're more like Taiwanese. <laughs> Another big key concept in peace of tourism is that there needs to be both quality and frequent 
contacts. And in this instance, both were lacking. Although almost every interviewee stated that they frequently saw Chinese tourists, hardly any of them actually had an opportunity to interact or with, with these Chinese tourists because the majority are group tourists who stay in their bubble and their the tour guide, you name it. And this quote I really, really like. It's one of my favorite quotes from all my, from my 130 page thesis from my, in my 37 interviews. She's just a student, very, very thoughtful. She's probably one of the best interviews. She really, when I asked her questions, she'd pause and kind of think about it and have, she, she has some really great answers. But this, I think, really does symbolize the concept of beach of tourism. She stated, you're afraid of things so you hate them. When you learn about something, you can understand it and accept it like different cultures and people. It really does symbolize the concept of peace of tourism, but also shows kind of two issues with the concept. One is that it assumes there actually is contact between tourists and hosts, and two, it assumes that there's good contact. So the whole crux of my research is has this influx of Chinese tourists, has it led to increased understanding between Taiwan and China? And the results in my study, as with previous studies, are very mixed. 54% said no, 46% said Yes, this just once again shows that tourism is very, very complex. It's more than just, it basically, if you, have, if you take two people from different cultures, put them in a room, there's no guarantee that that's going to lead to intercult intercultural understanding and peace. Just a few policy recommendations based on this research, specifically if peace through tourism is a goal. One is that every place indeed does have its infrastructural capacity, and that's something that government regulators should indeed take into account and regulate the amount that come in. Also, this research suggests that individual tourists are maybe more conducive to peace building than, than, than group tourists because they're more open to interaction and interested in the culture. And then as tourism is that double-edged sword, you have the positive aspects, you have the negative aspects, responsible tourism management is very key. You need to involve the government, the top, but also involve the locals because on a daily level, who's affected by influxes in tourists? Locals are. And they have to deal with increased traffic and all the negative and positive aspects. And lastly, from a Taiwan, specific to Taiwan, based on interview accounts, the Taiwanese government needs to do a better job of continually assessing, but also addressing the impacts from this influx of Chinese tourists. With that, I just want to thank the following funders for honestly making this research possible. I had a great time over there. I'd also like to give special thanks to my, my committee who spent many hours reading through my drafts of my thesis. But with that, thank you. <laughs>